Hi guys, Harps Harps here. Given that Spelljammer was recently confirmed by Wizards of the Coast, we're going to be talking about its wonderful history, how it started, who was involved with it, and what was some of the creative inspiration behind it. I was fortunate enough to be able to ask Jeff Grubb, the creator of Spelljammer, some questions about the setting over email, and so I'll be sharing his thoughts throughout the video, including his opinion on the recent 5e Spelljammer announcement near the end. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter, join the Discord, or sign up to my Patreon, then the links are all down below. You'll also find a list of all the sources that I've used for the research in this video. Okay, let's go. Spelljammer was published in 1989, and the idea was initially presented during a pitch meeting to Jim Ward and Warren Spector inside an Oggy's restaurant in Lake Geneva. Let's hear what Jeff had to say about the pitch. And this was, and this was Jim Ward was in charge, Warren Spector was his second in command, and we were all pitching ideas, and I pitched an idea of, you've got a guy in full armor, you know, a fighter, he's standing on the deck of a ship in space and he's not floating off and he's not getting he breathe and basically we have space adventures. And Jim loved that idea and that started us down the path that became Spelljammer. However, according to Grubb's blog, although he pitched the idea, he almost didn't get the go-ahead to design the setting, with Zeb Cook almost being given the opportunity. However, given that Zeb hadn't really been involved in Dragonlance, Jim Ward thought it would be a good place for him to flesh out, and therefore Zeb was given another part of Dragonlance instead of Spelljammer, whilst Grubb got the chance to design his space fantasy. I asked Jeff, with regards to you wanting to push the envelope on what D&D fantasy was, were there any other settings you pitched or had ideas for that never got the go-ahead? There were a number over the years. When I first got to TSR, they were looking for all sorts of new ideas. I pitched a cyberpunk idea, this was before R. Talzorian's excellent version, that was so dark and dystopian, it was burning a hole through the bottom of a filing cabinet. Management came back and said, what else you got? And I pitched a superhero game I created in college, which became Marvel Superheroes. Grapple against the forces of evil as a Marvel comic superhero. The name Spelljammer is not completely random, and actually originates from a type of commercial sailing ship called the Windjammer. It's an informal term that arose during the worldwide transition from the Age of Sail to the Age of Steam, with many books written about the period using the word to describe these soon-to-be obsolete vessels. Of course, where Windjammer was used exclusively as a noun, Jeff Grubb adapted Spelljammer so that it was a proper noun, being the name of a huge mysterious sentient ship inspired by the likes of the Flying Dutchman. Its noun form was the name of the setting and vessels associated with space travel, and finally it was used as a verb due to the act of space travel being spell jamming. Initially, the individuals involved in trademarking D&D products at TSR hated the name Spelljammer. They regularly wanted a name to mean nothing, but also capture the essence of the product which would make it easier to sell. This strategy is sort of visible in the Forgotten Realms, Dragonlance and Planescape, which really outside the context of D&D mean nothing, but do somewhat encapsulate their settings. Spelljammer on the other hand was a little more cryptic. Initially, fantasy in space didn't really come to mind at the mention of the word. I asked Jeff, were there any names other than Spelljammer that were considered by yourself or even suggested by the trademark guys? Not that I remember. Our legal staff rarely made suggestions, but pointed out where ideas we had would not fly. Marketing was usually the source of alternate names. They wanted to name Al-Kadim Burning Sands and Marvel Superheroes Marvel Comic Book Heroes. And Manual of the Planes was going to be Codex of the Planes but they had problems with a name being similar to a feminine hygiene product. They might have been right on that one. So I put to Jeff, when writing the Law Book of the Void, were there any specific films, books, art, etc. that helped to inspire you? I was reading through a lot of the early books about Aubrey and Maturin by Patrick O'Brien and old pirate films like Captain Blood. 
The Aubrey Maturin set of books is a nautical series set during the Napoleonic Wars and primarily focuses on the lives of Captain Jack Aubrey and the ship surgeon Stephen Maturin. The 2003 film Master and Commander was based upon the first book in the series, albeit it wasn't entirely faithful. Captain Blood was a film from 1935 about an Irish doctor called Peter Blood, who is convicted of treason against King James II. Sent to the West Indies and sold into slavery, he becomes a pirate rebel gaining fame amongst the Brotherhood of Buccaneers, eventually being pardoned by the new King of England, William III, and then saving the colony of Port Royal from French hands. It's the world. Those of you in favour of these articles, Raise your right hands and say aye! aye! Another early problem that the setting faced was how to link all the worlds together. Going to space wouldn't be much good if you couldn't travel through it. Spelljammer was material plane focused and TSR's material plane settings had different gods and different constellations. If you're traveling from Toril to Kryn, how would Spelljammer explain the sudden change in, well, everything? The answer, of course, were crystal spheres, inspired by this image here, which is actually a woodcut made by an unknown artist, having first been documented in a book by the French astronomer Camille Flammeron in 1888. Although Jeff Grubb first saw it on the cover of Daniel Borstein's book The Discoverers. The image depicts a robed man poking his head and arm through a star-filled bubble to bear witness to circling clouds, wheels and stars beyond the earth. It is an image that is frequently used to express the human quest for knowledge amongst the stars and is therefore quite fitting for Spelljammer. The crystal spheres allowed Spelljammer to have self-contained universes where existing cosmologies didn't have to be changed. One could simply traverse from one crystal sphere to another. In fact, Toril and Kryn have always been presented as heliocentric, meaning that they are not the center of their universes. They behave more or less like normal planets in their respective solar systems. Whereas Oerth, the main planet in the Greyhawk setting, is geocentric, it's the center of its solar system, behaving much like what some people in the past thought our own world was like. And maybe even some people today still think this. Obviously, not every setting got a fleshed out crystal sphere, and I asked Jeff the following. Dark Sun and Mistara were never fleshed out in the Spelljammer setting, did you ever consider it? Both were after Spelljammer's publication. The Dark Sun team, Tim Brown, Troy Denning, Mary Kirchhoff, wanted to keep their crystal sphere apart from the others, since they were creating a separate dystopian setting, and having an easy way off planet sort of defeated that. Mistara was originally the known world setting for the versions of basic expert companion masters and immortals, Dungeons and Dragons, so was outside our cosmology. By the time we folded it into D&D, Spelljammer had pretty much run its course. The area of space where planets, moons and suns resided was named as Wild Space, but when you wanted to go further afield to other crystal spheres, you had to travel through something called Phlogiston. The phlogiston, the rainbow ocean, the flow, an endless sea of every colour. This is a description presented to the reader by a gnome called Hub L, and perfectly captures the beauty of the Spelljammer setting. Phlogiston is used by spacefarers to travel from one crystal sphere to the next, and although it is possible to not use it, a journey would take many years without it. Phlogiston was a scientific theory that postulated that there was a fire-like element called phlogiston in combustible materials. Through many experiments, it eventually led to the discovery of oxygen, the true culprit in matters of combustion and rusting. But it was the theory around combustion that inspired phlogiston to be highly flammable in Spelljammer, making the routes that one can use to traverse between crystal spheres as highly volatile and explosive when in contact with fire. The wonderful art of Spelljammer was done by Jim Holloway, with the deck planes of various vessels by Dave LaForce. The best ship design according to Jeff was the Nautiloid, which cemented the mind flares in the setting so much that the marketing department at TSR were reluctant for them to appear in Ravenloft, in case it took something away from Spelljammer. They became so identified with space that when Jeff was working on Ravenloft, he had to demonstrate to marketing that they did in fact exist in D&D before Spelljammer was created. 
Whilst Jim was working on the designs for the Beholder ships, he presented five different ideas which were all well liked. This inspired the idea that Beholders would be in a genetic civil war within the Spelljammer setting. Beholders were a monster that had been interpreted differently over the years at TSR and Jeff combined these with Jim's ships to create this Beholder conflict. The giant space hamsters came about when the gnome Spelljammer appeared as if it had a gigantic hamster wheel on the side of it. So finally, Wizards of the Coast have recently announced the revival of Spelljammer after much teasing. With an April Fool's joke this year, Christopher Perkins himself teasing Space Clowns last year and then the host of hints to Spelljammer throughout various 5th edition adventures. But what does Jeff think about it all? I asked, why do you think it took so long for Wizards of the Coast to bring the Spelljammer setting back in an official capacity? As much as I love it and how it turned out, Spelljammer is a niche genre compared to the traditional fantasy of Realms, Dragonlance and Greyhawk. Wizards of the Coast has shown the ability to address old standing fan favourites with new worlds. I've been told they are old school fans as well and occasionally they would let something drop like a Spelljammer in the Dungeon of the Mad Mage or introducing the GIF and everyone would get all wound up and then Wizards of the Coast would go off and do something else. I think they liked teasing people like that. I then asked, I have seen that you were surprised about Wizards of the Coast announcement of Spelljammer in 5th edition. I find it bizarre that they didn't contact you about it. Do you believe they are trying to take the setting in a completely different direction? I hope they are planning to take it in a different direction. It has been almost 35 years since Spelljammer came out, and game design, storytelling and world building have all evolved since then. Wizards of the Coast has been changing the traditional canon and continuity to meet its current needs. More than Kanan and Ravenloft, Greyhawk figures in the realms. I support it like this. I like the Nautiloid in the Baldur's Gate 3 cinematic, where the old battering ram slash spike became these more prehensile tentacles. It is amusing for me that they did not bring me in on this, but I am not offended by it. I am involved with my own stuff, mostly building new worlds for computer companies these days. I'm currently working for Tempo Games, who are making the bazaar. Still, I live on the hill overlooking Wizards of the Coast HQ. I know a lot of the now senior design staff, and it is not like they couldn't have called and set up a lunch at a local teriyaki joint. But honestly, this is a no-lose situation for me personally. If it comes out and does well, it is because our original team provided a strong foundation for the campaign setting. If it comes out and doesn't do so well, people will talk about how cool the original flavour Spelljammer was, but I really want them to do well. Ok, one more thing. That original trailer that they just put out, something we couldn't do back in the day, it leads off with some poetry about how there are many types of worlds, but they all need heroes. I rolled my eyes when I heard it, but it turns out that I wrote that 35 years ago and gave the quote to Elminster. So yeah, I think things should evolve and improve over time. The poetry Jeff is referring to is in this WizKids Spelljammer trailer here. There are worlds beyond worlds. Cold, hot, light, dark, watery, and earthen. They all share one basic need, a need for heroes. And indeed, this is a quote by Elminster in the Law Book of the Void, seen here. Okay, I'd just like to say a big thank you to Jeff Grubb for answering some of my questions. I've linked some of the stuff that he's currently working on down below, and I can reveal that his favourite character to come out of the Spelljammer setting is this Beholder here. I have a soft spot for Large Luigi, who runs the Laughing Beholder on the Rock of Brawl. I don't think I created him, but he makes me smile as an opposite to Xanathar in Water Deep. Let me know your own favourite aspects of Spelljammer and what you're looking forward to in Wizards of the Coast new version of it down below. See you next time. Bye.